On September 18, 1934, a $10 gold certificate spent at a gas station was turned over to the FBI, and this man was convicted for the murder of the Lindbergh baby. Part of the $2,775,000 loot from the Brinks robbery was found by the FBI, whose six-year investigation led to the arrest and conviction of every member of the gang. 1956, an FBI handwriting team checked two million samples of handwriting and proved Angelo LaMarca kidnapped and killed a one-month-old baby. July 22, 1934, John Dillinger resisted arrest and was killed by FBI agents. June 21, 1957, Colonel Rudolf Abel, 30-year veteran of the Soviet spy system, was arrested when a hollow coin found by a newsboy revealed a microfilm spy message. It is a long and proud record of investigative work, 40 years of exemplary service to our nation. From his office, J. Edgar Hoover has placed on the entire organization his own rigid code of service, integrity, and morality. In a way that is true of few organizations, J. Edgar Hoover is the FBI. And that is our story. The story of a man, an organization, and their service to the nation, a story of fidelity, bravery, integrity. I'm Jack Brickhouse, and today, May 10th, 1964, the 40th anniversary of J. Edgar Hoover's appointment to the directorship of the Federal Bureau of Investigation has been officially proclaimed J. Edgar Hoover Day by the governor of Illinois, Otto Kerner. I'm happy to announce that on May 10th, 1964, I'm proclaiming that day to be J. Edgar Hoover Day in Illinois. It will be the 40th anniversary of J. Edgar Hoover's being head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It's been my pleasure to personally know Mr. Hoover because for seven years I was United States Attorney, a member of the Department of Justice for the Northern District of Illinois. And we had so many things that we were doing in the office in which Mr. Hoover had a personal interest. He's been a fine man. He's been outstanding. And he has certainly upheld the integrity of his investigative department. With all of the power that he might have assumed, he has done it very objectively and protected the privacy and the Bill of Rights so far as the people were concerned. He has been an outstanding public servant. And I think it would do us all well to celebrate this 40 years of public service to which J. Edgar Hoover has dedicated himself to the people of the United States. Virtually all Americans take the modern reputation of the FBI for granted, but it wasn't always this way. As Bob Considine, a longtime reporter on the national scene, will attest. I want to add my own salute to my fellow Washingtonian, J. Edgar Hoover, and a salute to the great men of the FBI, which he heads. You know, their great reputation, which is unlike anything perhaps in our history in the field of public service, wasn't uh, achieved very easily. There was a time, and it's hard to believe, when the people of the United States looked down upon the investigative arm of the Justice Department, and for good reason. Its then director, uh, actually took the main role in, um, in the violation of, the, uh, of a case uh, against a United States senator who's, who was uh, involved in a civil rights dispute and actually rigged uh, the case against this United States senator, assigned uh, an investigator to go into the offices of senators and rifle their files and open their mail. It's, as I say, it's hard to believe. Uh, well, actually, it was part and parcel of the whole national picture at that time. It was an ugly national scene. Corruption, crime, it was rampant all through the United States because of prohibition and other causes. Well, it was a time of the, of the great gangsters, let's say. And uh, into this scene, uh, uh, people hardly knew what to do, where to turn. And 
In this great crisis, uh, they looked around for a man who not only would know the workings of the investigative arm of the Bureau in the days after Calvin Coolidge, let's say, replaced the corrupt Harding administration, it was most obvious that drastic changes had to be made, and they were. The man who was to make them was the newly appointed Attorney General Harlan Fisk Stone, later to be Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. But in a bureau riddled with corruption and political favoritism, how was it possible to find a man who both knew the bureau and was honest? The answer came from an unexpected source. Though he was no relation to J. Edgar Hoover, it was the then Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, who set the wheels in motion for the director's appointment. As President Hoover told us in this telegram, it is a great pleasure for me to participate in this tribute to J. Edgar Hoover. When the late Chief Justice Stone asked me to suggest a possible appointment for the important task of reorganizing the Bureau of Investigation, everything I knew about J. Edgar Hoover made him seem the logical choice. It was a recommendation I made gladly at the time. Ever since then, and including my years as president, I've been proud of having made the suggestion. J. Edgar Hoover has served long and well and richly deserves this tribute from a grateful nation. Herbert Hoover. It was Mr. Hoover's recommendation that literally made the difference between the Bureau of Investigation prior to 1924 and today's Federal Bureau of Investigation with its 40-year history of service to the nation under J. Edgar Hoover's direction. The role of Mr. Hoover in this history is attested to by the action of both Democratic and Republican presidents, Herbert Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson have all retained Mr. Hoover in his office. The first years of J. Edgar Hoover's tenure as director were the time of reorganization. It was the wild, wild 20s. Bootleggers, cars, and a disrespect for law. With approximately 400 agents on the rolls, the Bureau was not to become well known until the end of the Prohibition era. As Bob Considine puts it, I met the director uh, as a result of a great tragedy. A good friend of mine, Carter Baum, who was an FBI agent, was killed in the early 30s in the line of duty, going after some of those outrageous mobsters of that period. I wrote a piece about Carter Baum. I used to play tennis with him in Washington. He was my doubles partner, a wonderful fellow. And I got a nice letter back from the director saying that Carter Baum did not die in vain, that his was a dedicated life dedicated to making this country a better place to live in. And to repeat, he did not die in vain, and we would soon see that he didn't. And ever since then, I've been a devotee and a reporter, actually, of the magnificent work of this Federal Bureau of Investigation under this magnificent American, J. Edgar Hoover. He had an enemy to fight, just as implacable a foe as the United States military forces ever had to face enemies of, of the nature of Dillinger and Corpus and Pretty Boy Floyd and those mugs. Um, but uh, we don't have them around today because of J. Edgar Hoover and his men. Curiously enough, the term G-Man, which the Bureau doesn't like particularly, was originated and minted, you might say, uh, by the underworld. It stood for government, of course. And the underworld sensed in the early 30s that the hot breath of the government was suddenly on their necks and things would never be the same again. They haven't since J. Edgar Hoover took over the Federal Bureau of Investigation. From the gloomy, crime-ridden days of the Depression, the FBI's activities have reflected the state of the nation and society's attempts to cope with its problems. The 30s were the era of two types of crime, kidnapping and the roving gang, which brought to the law books new laws to be investigated by the FBI. The first was the kidnap law set in motion by the murder of a 20-month-old baby kidnapped from his crib, Charles A. Lindbergh, Jr. His father was the most warmly loved hero of his time, and the whole nation was shocked to the depths of its heart, especially when it was finally learned that the baby had been killed. 
The FBI became involved in the case as advisors and scientific experts. The cold-blooded flow of ransom notes with their carefully worked out scheme of marks and holes to authenticate them continued until the ransom was paid. One of the ransom bills was turned into the FBI by a gas station attendant, and the net began to close in on Bruno Richard Hauptmann, who was in the United States illegally working as a carpenter. Some of the ransom money, a gun, and wood, which matched the makeshift ladder used to climb to the nursery window, were found in his home. He was convicted and executed in 1936, just over four years after the crime was committed. But now the resources of the FBI were turned against kidnappers. May I emphasize that the Federal Bureau of Investigation is as close to you as your nearest telephone. It belongs to you. It seeks to be your protector in all matters within its jurisdiction. However, if a member of your family is threatened with kidnapping and you keep it a secret, all the law enforcement agencies in the world cannot aid you. But if you give proper notification immediately upon the receipt of a threat of kidnapping or extortion, the entire power and facilities of this bureau will be thrown into action to bring the culprits to justice. The names and descriptions on wanted kidnappers flooded the nation. The latest techniques of science were mobilized to gather evidence. The FBI cooperated in ransom payments, but circulated serial numbers of bills so widely that spending a ransom bill became almost a guarantee of capture. The Lindbergh kidnapping law, with its subsequent amendments, today enables the FBI to enter a kidnapping case if the victim has been taken across a state line or in the absence of evidence of interstate transportation when 24 hours has elapsed since the victim's abduction. The Lindbergh kidnapping, the Urschel kidnapping, and hundreds of other crimes prove that the state line, as often as not, acted to protect the criminal when he fled the state in which the crime had been committed. Congress and President Roosevelt in mid-1934 provided the laws making it a federal violation to cross a state line after committing certain serious crimes or to escape prosecution for those crimes. Killing certain federal officers, robbing of banks operating under federal law, or using interstate communications such as the telephone or the telegraph in committing a crime also became violations under federal jurisdiction. With these laws, the FBI completed the smashing of the roving gangs of the Midwest in a blaze of gunfire. The training of FBI men, which J. Edgar Hoover had insisted on, paid off time and time again. Against Dillinger, against Machine Gun Kelly, Pretty Boy Floyd, and against the Barkers and Alvin Karpis. Ma Barker and her son Fred were killed resisting arrest in a house in Florida. A weird first family of crime. The Barkers were allied with Alvin Karpus, who had challenged J. Edgar Hoover to a gunfight in a strange Wild West showdown. With the Barkers eliminated, Mr. Hoover took personal charge of the search for Karpus. Karpus had been the leader in several kidnappings and gang battles with lawmen. He was truly one of the most bloodthirsty of these gang leaders. And yet, an expert FBI trap caught him without a shot. It was a strange period, but the FBI put an end to these small marauding armies of criminals, and the hero worship once given to the gangster was transferred to the men of the FBI. It was a beginning on the FBI's long struggle to bring professional standards and the respect due to professionals to all the law enforcement agencies, city, county, and state. How far they have succeeded is attested to by a past president of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, Stanley Schrotel, Chief of Police of Cincinnati. J. Edgar Hoover will live in the pages of history as an outstanding public servant. He established the FBI National Academy and augmented it with field FBI training services for police. He brought professionalization to police service, strengthened law enforcement cohesion, and he has, for four decades, been the outstanding example of dynamic leadership 
integrity, morality, competence, and patriotic nobility. The International Association of Chiefs of Police join the host in paying tribute to the Dean of the Enforcement Community. As Police Chief of Cincinnati, Ohio, I have come to realize the value of my personal relationship with Mr. Hoover and its effect in terms of an improved enforcement service for our city. The old shoot 'em up attack against the big gangs of the 30s was spectacular. The silent war against subversion and espionage is tremendously dramatic. But this routine newsreel shot is a symbol of one of three great services the FBI performs for local law enforcement agencies. It's one of these services that Chief Schrotel is speaking of when he talks about the improved local law enforcement. These men formed the first class in 1935 of the FBI National Academy. Almost 4,500 men have taken the tough 12-week course. They grind away at their books in classes. They take their lumps in an intensive physical training course. Learn the hundreds of types of American foreign and homemade weapons that can be used by criminals. Learn to collect evidence at a crime scene. Go through a fast orientation course in the sciences as they apply to physical evidence. They learn the business of taking and classifying fingerprints. And they learn what many small cities or counties never teach their police officers, how to stay alive against an armed criminal with death in his heart. Back home after his course, the trained police officer does his most important work, teaching what he himself has learned. Thus, the effectiveness of the National Academy is multiplied many times over. With the help of FBI agents, over 100,000 officers a year attend additional special training courses in the skills of professional police work. These men were only a very small beginning to a tremendous effort to raise the professional quality of local police work all over the nation. Within the FBI offices, two more major services are offered to local law enforcement agencies, scientific examination of evidence and fingerprint identification of locally arrested suspects. Requests for this aid come into the FBI mail room in a flood every day of the year. Evidence collected from a crime scene or a criminal goes to the laboratory for examination. Requests for identification or information go to the vast file rooms. Within the FBI central offices is one of the world's greatest accumulations of knowledge, skills, and information on crime and criminals. In the laboratories, almost a quarter of a million different examinations were made of physical evidence. Blood found on a murder suspect, paint fragments from a hit and run case, flecks of metal, individual hairs, fibers from clothing. Every physical item that could possibly convict a guilty man or free an innocent one is examined exhaustively by scientists. And what is even more important, these men will travel the country over to testify as recognized experts in the courts of the whole nation. All these services are free to the local law enforcement agency. In 1924, J. Edgar Hoover set out to devote his life to better law enforcement for the whole nation. And through these services, the FBI works endlessly to that goal. Better law enforcement the nation over through ever more highly professional local law enforcement agencies. In the 40 years that J. Edgar Hoover has guided the FBI, it has worked against many subversive forces, some of them originating outside our country, others originating within our borders. The Ku Klux Klan was a national organization that could muster frightening political power in northern as well as southern states. It once threw 50,000 members into a political demonstration in the nation's capital. A decade later, the FBI was working against another uniformed organization aimed at overthrowing the government of the United States by force. Hardly had that group been dissipated when another, this time without fancy uniforms, renewed the endless battle. This part of the long struggle against subversion has been going on since World War I. It was in 1919 that J. Edgar Hoover, then a young lawyer in the Justice Department, wrote the department's first legal study on the newly formed Communist Party. This battle 
has gone on behind the scenes through all the presidential administration since 1920. J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI have been continuously in the forefront of the battle. Again and again, presidents of the United States have marked J. Edgar Hoover's service to the nation, this time with the National Security Medal. Mr. Hoover, your dedication and devotion to public service are so long and so well known. Your accomplishments in that service are so great and so well known that it seems idle for me to try to say anything that could add to the dignity of this ceremony. Perhaps it is just best for me to say I am proud uh, to be uh, an agent for our people in conferring upon you this highest award that the government has and to say that your real uh, reward, as all of us here know, is in the hearts and thanks and the gratitude of our entire nation. Like the battle against the German-American Bund, the fight against the Communist Party has been a double battle, one against the subversion of the principles of American society, the other against espionage, a direct aid to a government inimical to the United States. Dramatic as spy work seems to be when produced for Hollywood, no movie director would ever have made these films as they actually were shot. You can just hear the producer scream, but nothing happens. Hours of film and nothing happens. And yet, at this moment, right before your eyes is a drama of attempted subversion of a respected army officer. Treason, betrayal, double-cross, suspicion, and possible murder. This is the scene. Hundreds of New York citizens strolling through one of the world's great spy dramas at 86th and Madison Avenue. This man, the Russians believed to be an army colonel who has agreed to betray America for cash. This is his Russian contact in New York. He is carefully checking the street, the cars, the buildings to make sure the meat will not turn out to be a trap. Minute after minute goes by. The traitor and the spy pay no attention to each other. The spy is not aware that FBI cameras are trained on him. Yet, he's a careful man. Finally, the man the spy was to meet leaves, and in a few seconds, the spy walks away too. Nothing, absolutely nothing, has appeared to happen. Yet it has. Another spy, Maxim Martinov, is now sure that the meet can be successful, so he arranges a second meet. But again, spy and apparent traitor pace back and forth without acknowledging each other. The FBI cameramen sweat it out. Maybe nothing will happen again. But it does, all of a sudden, as natural as two old friends greeting each other on a street corner. Treason, betrayal, espionage, and counter-espionage are as undramatic as this. Yes, I used to live at 19 Spechstrasse, and two old friends stroll over to Central Park for a chat. Martinoff didn't know the Army Colonel, but he knows a lot about him. Especially that the Army Colonel has told a high Russian Air Force official that he will betray America. What the Russian doesn't know is, the Colonel also told his superior officer, who in turn told the FBI. The real Colonel was completely loyal. The Colonel on the corner is in fact a special agent for the FBI, made up to resemble the officer Martinoff expected to meet. But finally, the Russian agent is satisfied. He accepts phony plans from the Army Staff College from a phony colonel. And the real arrest is made. As a diplomat, the Russian cannot be jailed. But he's ordered out of America for good to answer to his superiors for complete failure.
Probably no other law enforcement agency in the world has such a varied jurisdiction. Its responsibilities have expanded throughout the years until today it includes over 170 investigative matters in the criminal, security, and civil fields. To mention a few, kidnapping, extortion, bank robbery, interstate transportation of stolen property, motor vehicles, gambling devices or obscene material, investigations involving the internal security of our country as espionage, sabotage, and other subversive matters, plus a host of others. The FBI's jurisdiction is derived from directives issued by the President, legislation enacted by Congress, and orders of the Attorney General. Its role in investigation violations of federal law is strictly that of a fact-gathering agency. No recommendations nor opinions are expressed in connection with any of its investigations. That original statement of policy held rigidly through 40 years of the strain of the battle against crime, subversion, and espionage has made the FBI one of the top investigative agencies of our nation and our time. J. Edgar Hoover set the standards and through 40 years made sure they were lived up to. Probably nowhere in the government of the United States is any one bureau so truly the reflection of the honesty, integrity, and dedication of a single individual. Few people have been honored by so many presidents. As Lyndon B. Johnson has said, I'm very proud to join in this tribute to one of America's most outstanding public servants, J. Edgar Hoover. Director Hoover and I have enjoyed a long friendship. For some 19 years, we lived across the street, neighbors in Washington. Today, it is gratifying to observe the 40th anniversary of J. Edgar Hoover's service as director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. In 1924, the FBI had only 156 agents. Now there are 6,000 special agents. This growth reflects the changing climate of the world in which we live, but it also reflects the great trust which Mr. Hoover's conduct of his sensitive responsibilities has won from many administrations, many Congresses, and many generations of the American people. The Bureau's effectiveness against crime and its diligence in supervising this nation's internal security have been outstanding achievements. But we are especially fortunate to have Mr. Hoover's strong personal dedication to maintaining the high standards of protection for civil liberties of the individual under our system of law. We, the citizens of Illinois, join with the President in offering this richly deserved tribute. A tribute each American offers to the fidelity, bravery, and integrity of J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI.